Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take a walk around various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I do user experience design and provide coaching services, and I'm an interactive maker. Oh, that was a nice and concise one. Holy cow, you put it in a bowl. You put it in a bowl on the island in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Normally when I when I open up that the the um the bag of cookies, it's more like a um like a pro wrestler, <laughs> like a like an affectation where I'm like, pow, cookies in the room, right? Like maybe you get some dust on you. I don't know. Maybe you catch one. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, it, it, for those who are new to the show, like this has been an ongoing thing. Is that I walk in going, "Hi, I'm a cartoonist, teacher artist," and Rob goes, "Well, I'm three of these, two of those, five of those, a little bit of this." You know, it's like, yeah, the bag of cookies opens up, but like the 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 the. Uh, ambiguity and varied interpretations of job uh, of, of jobs that you perform and services you render has not been easy to succinctly describe. But that was you came in and just went like plunk. This this mm. is wrapping your brain very quickly and uh, efficiently around this idea of what I can do for you today. Well, it's a fun exercise. It's also it's weird. It's like um, it's a bit of an existential crisis every single episode where like. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of us knows uh, like a, like a perfect concise title every time for over 300 episodes. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, am I what someone paid me to do last? Is that all I am? Am oh, I yeah. more? Who yeah. am I? Well, yeah. let me give it a try in this context for this situation, because a lot of folks who listen to this, you're also makers and you're, you you're creating you know often visual stories and that kind of stuff so you're dealing with with i mean we have a lot of common ground and but like i use storytelling for a ton of different things i mean it's and and i could describe any of those with greater emphasis or not even mention it or a little bit of emphasis i don't know so yeah it's it's a funny puzzle every time um so it's it's a bit of an improv um quirk in the show yeah it but, is hey once in a while like it you know Every few dozen, I uh, I get a smooth, smooth improv. Now, do you and, uh, do you remember what it. do you remember what you you said there? So we could package it up again. Well, I'm recording, so in a way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I recorded it, so I don't have to remember it. That is exactly right. Okay. Well, uh, for those who are new to the show as well, we usually pick a single topic and and usually inspired by either conversations that happen in our Discord chat, which we can we'll talk about in the you know, last section of the show, um, or what's happening in our lives as creative people. Those ideas inspire become like sort of like a central idea that we explore in a. a as thorough a way as we can in less than an hour. And the first section, we usually look at what it looks like, what we're experiencing as far as this topic goes. And then we back away and think about, okay, how do we think about this topic when we're engaging with it? So, and we usually start with some kind of musical uh, indication of moving on to the next section. For those who are sort of listening, half listening in their studio, when you hear this happen... That means we're now doing the show. <laughs> and Rob gets excited. I, I do this specifically just to like, just get a little <laughs> bit of extra um, adrenaline into his system. Pow! Okay, now we can talk like a little bit intensely about this stuff. Uh, so, I so don't what, need that much encouragement, but you, you basically, you could be like, are, you could just literally ask me, are you feeling excited to try to go through a topic? I'd be like, yeah, heck yeah, let's go. But you're like, well, I could pump it through all your nerves all at once. I moved, I moved, to, I moved to a new neighborhood and I'm, you know, I bought a house and uh, I met some of our neighbors. And one of our neighbors is this, this, this very interesting older gentleman who we were discussing how to deal with some like sort of city problems and like reaching out to different, you know, boards and whatever to like, 
talk how, how to address this. And I'm looking at it like anybody who's listened to the show for a long time is like, Jersey's probably going to want to talk about a gentle approach to this thing. Like, how do we talk about this in a thoughtful way that really brings all of the, the different skin in the game we have? And then the, 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 the neighbor's like, no, I think we should put a little relish on it. <laughs> like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard that expression, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> and it's like, that's, that's me like putting that. a little bit of relish on the topic transition by playing the Dragon Ball theme. Anyway. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Oh, well, and and um, I'm sold now too. I'm gonna try to use that one. Like, it's got well, it's got layers to it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a food and uh, like a descriptive emotional word too. So all that's right. right. Yeah. All right. So relish flavor. Relish applied to our podcast hot dog. Um, <laughs> what what do we talk about this week? So um, this was one that I have been actually wrestling with for a while now. And I anticipate that we might get into some kind of uncomfortable areas for me. And so people can look forward to that. But, um, and it's a topic we've approached at different times in the show. But I think in the past, we've approached it sort of at an arm's length, conceptually speaking, hiring yourself to do a job, you know? Um, and what do we mean by hiring ourselves? Uh, can you summarize this, Rob? Because that, that was the phrase you used when you were texting me. And I was like, I like that term. Well, okay. So the process of hiring, you're, you're sort of, um, you want to do some kind of exchange of resources to provide a service or make, create a thing. And, um, so folks who make their, let's, let's see, you're, you're sort of determining yourself, where do you want to go next creatively this, this, this next milestone. And, uh, well, you want to make a story, you want to make a movie, you want to make a game maybe. Um, and then, well, who's going to going to fund that endeavor? Okay, so if you if you go about getting hired to do that thing functionally, it's probably not your game, your story, what have you. You're you're providing a service that uses the same skills. A lot of us are in that that situation of like, well, you've got a way to keep the lights on, you've got a day job, but then you've got your your other things that you do. But but like t- taking one of those things and getting um like you can get hired to make the thing you want. You can get investment. You can get um sort of uh, brought through things that we don't think of oftentimes as like investment because there's such like storied and common mechanisms. The idea of like, well, pitching a book, pitching a show or something, and then then um, it's established organizations in the field say you're funded, right? But that's an investment. And, and so like that same thing works if you're doing a startup and you take on uh, an angel investor or you, you go, or you go through an incubator or something like that. Um, but who's investing, right? So hiring yourself means, okay, well, you pitched to yourself in one and you're going to fund yourself to do that thing. Yeah, yeah. And so this, that's, that's another way of saying, like in, in my case, when it comes to different comics projects, am I going to webcomic it, self-publish it, or am I going to seek partnership and investment in terms of, or in other words, a publisher who will pay me in advance in order to... Com- secure my time for the next year while I make the book? Or do I try to find other ways to finance it? uh, Or am I going to finance it by donating my time to it as a side hustle until it catches on? Um, Lots of different tensions there. Um, And there's pros and cons to all these things. So to get into like what specifically I'm talking about, last October, October 2019, so almost a year ago, I put together a pitch for a book that I had been um, developing for, thoughtfully developing for at least the last five years, but been thinking about for almost 20. You know, like I, f- I found some mm. published work that I did in 2002 where this character showed up on the cover because I was like dropping, like seeding out this idea of eventually I'm going to do something with this guy, but in the meantime, I'll just put him in backgrounds of things. Um, so, and, and then, you know, like the last five years, spending a lot of time, like posting images to Instagram, seeing what gets reactions, trying out different ideas, writing a whole bunch of notes. And finally, last October, I was like, okay, I'm committing to something. Actually, I want to say 2018, I did a mini comic about the character, Baron Von Bear, for Inktober. And then in 2019, I'm like, well, let's see if we can turn this into a pitch now. Um, building on my experience of 
you know, going through that little bit of applied research of making an eight-page mini comic about the character. So I, I did. I came up with, um, I can actually pull it up on screen, you know, a little bit of the pitch, and I was pretty happy with it. I think it was it was a pretty strong uh, summary of what the comic could be about. It was a cool-looking pitch. I put together like a, like a PowerPoint presentation with lots of little incidental pieces of art and, you know, explaining all the characters and what can happen in the story. Um which and, so you're 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 showing this mechanism this thing this artifact you created that I mean it's not the entire story like you've got you you have pieces of it that represent sort of like um well think about like okay you're going to start like a um you're going to start a bookstore you're going to start some local business or whatever there's uh areas of concern there's strategies and plans and things to research and understand about that overall problem and then if someone if you want to get money for that then you you need to show that you've addressed those kinds of you know the the issues that go into being successful with this right mm -hmm. so that's what you've you've got in that pitch yeah the like, pitch demonstrates i've thought this thing through to the point where it's now developed enough that you can understand what it could possibly look like but it's undeveloped enough that you can be a partner in the co-creation of this thing and that's based on a lot of editors that i've talked with and heard talk about what they're looking for in acquiring a project that they don't want something that's too developed because they want to have a hand in shaping it. And, and, mm -hmm. and to me that, that, that is a negotiation I'm happy to get into. I'm happy to look at what that back and forth looks like, right? If it means that, um, a, I'm going to have an advance to, you know, support myself while I'm making the thing and B they're going to come in with infrastructure and reach and audience that I don't have easy or immediate access to, right? So like there's, there's, there's a value exchange at work there and me meeting them halfway is saying, okay, I'm putting together a deck that demonstrates I've thought this thing through enough that we can now engage, engage in trade to see if we want to turn it into something like a 200 page book, right? Um, so <laughs> here we are, it's been almost a year and I have received a lot of passes on it. Um, I, I have gone through a lot of editors that I have relationships with and have good relationships with people who have said to me, I like your work. Please show me more of your work. And I go, okay, here's the thing. You know, I mean, uh, and they say, well, not, not this one. Uh, and, and, in in to be, you know, completely fair to the editors, almost all of them said, but please do send me something else. Please share something else with me. Right. Um, and in full, per, to, to like acknowledge also like greater perspective, a year, eight months, 10 months is not that long, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, you hear stories about people who have gotten hundreds of rejection letters, right? So it's like, it's, I'm not, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. This is me saying like, oh, I've come to lean into art to say like, isn't my life tough? Uh, <clears throat> you just don't know. Rob, how it is in my line of work. Uh, but I'm getting a bum deal from everybody on this. No, it's it's more like I'm getting I'm getting a mix of signals saying like we like your work, but not that thing. Now, but I really like that thing, and I worked really hard to develop a efficient way of doing it so that the, the goal was is that like I'd get an advance and I'd do the book in eight months, right? If, if this is my full-time job, I could do it in eight months and then I would actually make the advance a more efficient or more, I'd, I'd add more value to the advance, right? And this is based on a conversation we had in past episodes about Chris Schweitzer saying like, look, advances are low. Um, so try to find a project that looks good but is optimized for speed. And it's like that, this was it. This was me like trying to find that efficiency. So it's like, it won't take that much time to do. And I really like the idea. I feel like it's a strong idea. Um, well, yeah, think about that though, too. Like you're giving yourself permission to, well, you're, you're doing your art as a business. That I mean that, and you're thinking part of that is the exchange and the rate of, for which you, so if you get, you know, you get so much investment, the more efficiently you can create the product, the better the, um, that exchange for your business because there are other things to make other adventures to have and all that kind of stuff to keep the overall machine going right you're mm -hmm. not sort of um you know like a just burn out like quickly get fuel um use it all up have almost nothing left and then drag yourself across the finish line for 
for a project, right? You're there to succeed. So, and, and keep succeeding, not just, you know, barely survive at once. So right. it's, it, I yeah. think these are important things to think of that not a lot of, like we obviously are hopefully love what we make, right? So that fuels us to an extent, but like to make it a business, that sort of, um, I, those concerns are worth navigating mm-hmm. and are important. Yes, your technique matters. Yes, your your store and your content and the all the, uh, you know, everything about what you're you're putting your creative voice into the world matters and also that business stuff. So I think it's really cool that you're modeling that thought process. Oh, great. And I just, yeah, that's, that's a useful aspect of this um, to, to say like, well, yeah, I want to eat today and I want to keep eating a year from now. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and, and I want to fuel that through this art, right? I, I, I just did it's a, part of it. I just did a school visit with um, a college class where we were talking about this very idea of pitching and I was really trying to draw attention to like, this is going to bum me out. But yeah, in in addition to all the skill acquisition you have to do in terms of being able to actually make the work good, there's this whole next level of, and I'm not even talking about taxes and managing your finances. That's a whole other thing. But now there's this whole idea of like, well, how do I bring what I think is valuable about my work into a place and make it clear to what what the value is so that people will want to engage and trade with it, whether that's doing a Kickstarter, whether that's doing a Patreon, whether that's working with an editor. Um, and so one of the things I did is I did research on the publishing lines from the different editors I was approaching and say, okay, here's the things that they're editing. Here's the things that their publishing house is focusing on. How can I, what do I notice about, what are the similarities in there? What do I infer from like what their taste is based on what I'm seeing? And also, can I point to, they, they, they call this like read alikes, right? Like, can I point to any hits that they have that my thing is like? And like, so you, I literally said in some of the, the uh, query letters, I was like, I think this book would be shelved between these two books, right? Like using that metaphor for explaining mm-hmm. like how this is similar to things that have already proven themselves in the industry and changing my language in the query letters to that editor in the case of if it's somebody that I've worked with in the past and had like a positive reaction with, hey, I hope your summer's going great. Had a great time listening to you on this podcast, et cetera. And then also like tailoring the way I describe what the premise is to be more in line with signals that I've either gotten directly from them or through their publishing line to like say like um, make it more re- reduce the amount of friction between them saying I don't know to yeah let's do this thing right um, so there's a lot of research on that and I did get over overall all the feedback I got from editors was very positive right well maybe they're being polite maybe but there were people who said specifically like I love your art Continue, please continue to share pitches with me. One person even said something like, well, I like this a lot. I feel like it's for a different audience. Could you repitch it for a different audience? And I'm like, I don't know. I'll have to think about that, right? Um, but a, uh, a benefit of doing that research and getting that interaction is that I feel like I've developed very clear language on describing the aboutness of this project. I feel like I could stand in front of an audience and say like, this book is about this, right? And, and um, in no uncertain terms, because I've had to have those conversations with people over and over and over again, even before the things, even before I've drawn a, a real page of work, right? Um, so even though it didn't work, even though I didn't succeed in, in finding a partner to engage and trade with on this, at least I've got that, right? I've got a clear sense of what this thing is, which makes me all the more excited about it. I feel like it's in, it's been rendered into a kind of focus that I don't often have when I take on new projects because normally I'm just coming up with a mini comic to just try out an idea and like, we'll see what it is. Well, now I know what it is, right? And I have a really clear sense of like how I could position it as this is talking about ideas that I'm not seeing discussed in a clear and explicit way in other projects. So. Hmm. So let's see. So you, ha- you have a lot of lessons you have. a So, I mean, you're, and you're describing uh, product development too. Mm-hmm. So you you go from, um, I mean, there's so many layers of, of like all like this, this weaves to with a lot of different topics that we've talked about Yeah. where, yeah, you've, you've, um, we've, we've talked about product development. How can you get to understand your product enough to know like 
when to go further with it or, or how it mean, you know, what does it mean to the audience that you're trying to, to reach and all that. But then here you're, you're doing that as also including organizations that you want to get funding. Um, and I mean, it helped strengthen your pro like you sounds like you iterated on, on your product yeah. a lot during that time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing is like, so it's, it raises the question is like, like with some of the feedback I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll cite a couple specific examples of, I received feedback from not only editors, but also people in my field that like, you know what, um, market decisions, like in one case they were like, if the market was different, I would buy this in a second. I'm having, you know, like, because it's like fantasy with animals, I'm not, I'm not confident that it will do well. And I would hate to fund a thing that languishes in the market. And not, not only editors, but also fellow cartoonists said, now, if you did the same thing, but make it about contemporary kids, you know, uh, I bet you it would find traction. And some advice, we'll talk about this in the second section, is like some advice from, from, uh, from peers kind of led in the direction of, based on, I think, some pretty broad assumptions about people saying like, well, teachers and librarians are definitely going to like recommend it more if it has children in it rather than people, uh, animals and people clothes. I'm like, well... Maybe. I don't know about that. I'd have to do some polling <laughs> to find that out. That's that's a, that's an assumption based on, like, I don't see any data in front of me. But if somebody says, like, hey, I've got data and animal animal stories, at least in our publishing house, isn't aren't doing that great. OK, that's fair. You know, and I'm not going to push super hard back on that. Right. Um, but this came up where. Um, now, I'll, I'll save it for the second section. When we talk about this, but like it raises the question of like, so what do I do? What do I do, Rob? Do I, I take this thing that I learned a lot from, I developed new efficiencies in, in, to make it, and I feel like it's, it's on the blocks, ready to go. Do I say, nope, the time isn't right for this because the industry said no, uh, and maybe I should try to like tailor, develop a whole new thing that is more in line with the feedback I'm getting? Or do I say, well, I'm just going to make the thing anyway, I'll hire myself, and not to prove anybody wrong, but maybe to, to make the case, prove the case that, that I know is true about this thing, which would require a whole nother realm of, um, uh, what would I say? Research, commitment, iteration, and learning. And what's holding me back from that? Did I, did I tease out what we're going to do in the second section in an interesting way? Well, I think you did a, Awesome job. Like this okay. is, this is because, <laughs> you know, essentially we want to hear um, is, you know, how, how do you navigate that question? Is it time to hire yourself? Yep. So. All right. Well, we'll in, in a minute and a half, we will talk about that. Like how, what do I, what do I do next? And how do I think about the different choices that are in front of me as a way to model this exercise of thinking about, you know, when to negotiate with other parties and when to take it on yourself and what negotiations you're, exploring at that point. But first, we got to thank some people who make the show possible. And those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. Speaking about engaging in trade, if you believe in us and what we are doing here at this lean into art thing, uh, you can make it more sustainable and you can like exchange some value with us. If we provided value in your life, you can, you know, contribute as little as a dollar a month. You can cancel at any time. Uh, you can just like show up, do a contribution, avail yourself of the behind the scenes content, and then, you know, cancel your contribution. But I want to thank five people who have been contributing on a regular basis, uh, on a monthly basis. First, David Armentrout. Thank you, David, for believing in us and what we do. Uh, Dado, you find uh, Dado Tronic, D A D O Tronic on Twitter. Thank you, Dado, for supporting the show. And Greg Horvath. Thank you, Greg. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGM Horv77. These will all be linked in the show notes, by the way. And Ashley Knapp. Thank you, Ashley. Been supporting us virtually since the Patreon started. It means a lot to us, Ashley. And Jonathan Warnson. Thank you, Jonathan. You can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with the fellow leaners and also get you access to the Patreon section of the Lean Into Art Discord, where you can share all sorts of work and social channels and where this episode is being streamed right now. Thanks to everybody who's been supporting us at patreon.com slash It means a lot to us. Thank you so much. It really does. Um, 
and yeah, a lot, lot of good benefits out there for you too, to join in. So hopefully the value exchange just grows, right? All right. Yep. All right. Here we are, huh? Yeah. Intense, intense music to show that we're going to talk about some intense stuff probably, right? Um, mm. Examining what I'm going to do. So this question sort of like came to mind when <laughs> um, I was... Okay, this is this is where my life is right now, Rob. And this I think where a lot of cartoonists' lives are right now, uh, given everything that's happening in the world. Um, I had to start scheduling two hours a week for private or like personal drawing time. Like I have so little time in my schedule um, to pursue any creative work of my own that it's like Ann and I had a meeting where like, okay, Wednesday nights from seven to nine is personal drawing time. Let's go to our respective studios and just explore something on our own, just for the like engage in play for crying out loud, you know, in, in addition to all this hunting that we have to do as creative entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and let me see if my overhead cam is working. Ah, so yeah. So a couple weeks ago during my, uh, personal drawing time, I said, okay, what would I do if I took the Baron von Baer concept and made it about contemporary kids instead, you know? And, I'm, I'm drawn away at this thing and I don't know who these children are. Okay. I, I just started, I just started doodling kids in my sketchbook. Actually, I opened up uh, Pinterest and I searched for tween fashion and I looked at pictures of kids and I started just drawing the kids in my sketchbook. And then when I was waiting at the um, auto dealership for an oil change, I sketched out this little thing real quick uh, from those kids in my mm -hmm. sketchbook. And then I scanned it, took it into Clip Studio Paint, penciled it, and then I printed it on a watercolor paper and started inking it. And, you know, it's it's it feels like it's a very jersey drawing in that it's got the kids in like uh like sort of back to back looking around and there's like creepy creatures in the background and the weird little spikes come out of the ground with like gross bugs and moss on it. And the idea that I was playing with was is like, okay, well, if I took creepy story, put contemporary kids. Well, Stranger Things feels like everybody's going to think of that. So what would I do different? I was like, well, the, the, the high concept I had when I was doing this drawing was like, what if I took like the J John Carpenter Apocalypse trilogy, but made it for 12 year olds, right? Because I love his Apocalypse trilogy, which is like Prince of Darkness and the Mouth of Madness and the thing. And uh, like, how, how can I capture what I love about those stories and apply it to... Um, a little kid's book and I'm, I'm drawing away and I don't, like I said, not much investment at this point, but Anne comes in. She's like, what are you doing? And I tell her and she's like, Oh, huh, why don't you just do Baron Von Bear? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and, and like the, the, the rush of emotion that flowed through me in that moment was like, it was very revealing. I was like, that is a fair question. And I am operating right now in an instinctual sort of space. And that's a signal to back away and ask myself, what are these emotions signaling? What, what, what do these emotions mean? So that was when I started asking my question, is it time to hire myself? Should I just do the thing on my own? And I've gotten a lot of advice on this from different people, right? Like I remember I was having breakfast with Kazu Kibuishi after a two calf one year, and he was looking at pickles and Taft, a mini comic that I made a couple years back. And, and he said to me, he asked straightforward, he's like, why aren't you published at Scholastic? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. That'd be awesome. I would love for this stuff to be published in like in the Scholastic Book Fair and, you know, actually have like, you know, have my books earn out. That'd be cool. Kids reading my books. Love it. And I said, but it, it just I haven't given them anything that clicks yet. And Kazu said, well, why don't you just make it and just be prepared to make it again? You know, because like if you demonstrate that it, it, it's it, what it could be they'll see it and they'll just want you to probably like tailor it a little bit. I'm like, okay, that's reasonable, you know? And on an episode of comics are great episode 95, which I'll link to in the show notes, Jason Shiga said the same thing to me on the show where he was like, you know, it's really hard for people to imagine what something can be. So sometimes you have to just show them, you have to make it first, prove the concept. And then people will line up to say, yes, I'm ready to invest in this thing now. I'm like, okay, that's fair. It's tough. But it's, it's fair, you know? Um, and on the other hand, I've gotten lots of advice on, like, navigating the publishing world, where it's people are like, well, you got to do an origin story. Nobody wants to read something starting out midstream. Got to explain where everybody comes from. Got to explain how the relationships are formed. That's the way it works, you know? Like, that kind of level of confidence, you know? Um, 
And then, like I said earlier, like other people are like, well, more educators are going to like be, get behind your book if it actually shows children because people want to see themselves in stories. I'm like, yeah, well, there's different kinds of seeing yourself in a story, you know. Like, I got pretty excited when I was watching Black Panther and the leader of the ape clan was like, we're vegetarians. And I'm like, well, he doesn't look anything like me. This guy could kill me with his bare hands, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think it's really cool to see a big, strong, really awesome dude who is like, I don't like to hurt animals. I'm like, wow, I feel I feel seen, you know, I feel like I connect with this character in a new way. You know, like there's different kinds of being seen. So, um yeah. So, and then, and then I'll, I'm going to give you a chance to like reflect or respond to what I'm, I'm dumping here on the ground, Rob, as I come in with my bag of cookies and explode it. Is <laughs> <laughs> that's totally what I'm doing. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, but there's a part of me who is gets really intoxicated on solving creative problems, and so is it, when I was having this conversation with Anne, I'm like, well. You know, they presented me with a problem. Can you do the same thing, but with contemporary kids? You know, can you do Baron Von Bear, but with kids with cell phones? Well, let's see. Let me explore that. And I get, I get really hooked on that. Like, I could, this is a solvable problem. I could fix this, right? <laughs> like, the Super Comics Challenge game show, Rob has heard me talk about this endlessly. It's like, it's really, really exciting when I find a way to do something that, that doesn't seem intuitively possible for a very specific audience and serves multiple constituencies. That gets me super juiced up. So it's like, I kind of felt like, well, I guess it's just time to do that now. But when Ann said to me, but, but you've already solved it. You figured it out with this other thing that you've been working on for like 20 years. Isn't it time just to do it, you know, and then just prove the case instead of trying to chase other people's advice and other people's input, you know? So this is a fair question. Am I, am I seeking partnership and investment because that's the safer way to go you know am i doing it uh am i trying to offload the risk of making the thing to somebody else am i doing it because i feel like this is the more respected way to do it you know um i don't know hmm. so that's a big deal. Like, like that, where you landed is, is the why, like there's so many other pieces of this, of this picture that um, to navigate, to find the correct answer for you, for you right now. Right. Because there could be correct answers during your creative journey. Like that made sense at one time that don't no longer make sense or something that didn't make sense then. And that makes sense now. Right. So how do you meet this collective moment of what's right for you right now? Yeah. Um, what, you know, like, why are you doing this um, functionally? Right. So like it, it's, these questions are so big and able to be um, just confused, right? Because you can bring up more criteria, more ways to investigate, more ways to whatever. But like, in the end, are you in a position to like, like, what is this project for you and, and why? And then the other questions can, can go from there. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause if you're doing this, where you, if this is a, a business deal to make, to fund your life tactically. Okay. That's one thing. Is, is it a long-term investment? So it's strategic, right? Like that, that, these are, you know, like what, what force, what influence is informing your why right now right. and then build from there. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can continue with other criteria, but like, <laughs> I mean, does that, no, that, that, um, that, that's, that is a reasonable question. Right. Um, and it is, I think it's an important one. It, and this, this goes to something that my friend Jesse guided me through and he, when he asked me, well, what would teacher Jersey say to his student? in this scenario. And I'm like, Oh, well, the, the number one is you would say, well, what do you want out of the work? Is this work that you want right. to be your bread and butter? Is it something where you want this to be your full-time job? Well, there's going to be some negotiations that happen in a variety of levels. Is this something where you want this to be a, um, a representation of a very specific value that you have to offer? Then perhaps this could be a side hustle thing that you're doing to like sort of establish currently what you are about as a creator, right? Mm -hmm. Is this something well, where you're doing it to, to like level up in ways that you hadn't previously leveled up? Is this something where it's about your own development as an artist? That's another thing to ask yourself. 
So, because what makes sense to as far as criteria to navigate the, the decision, it's really about um, how like like meeting yourself where you're at in the context. So if I like if I take an example, I've been doing a bit of reflection about my project Art Geek Zoo that I did about ten years ago, twelve years ago or so, and. Uh, I wasn't ready at the time to, to, to say a variety of things about it, but you know, you get some distance and what have you. I was doing a lot of skill building and product development in public. It was functionally a comic. It had an audience. It did entertain. I made that into a book that I sold and it's, it worked that, but like, if I look back at the project now through different lenses and what have you, like my why then is different than my why now. And Right. So like then I was, I had, I broke this, this habit of, of perfectionism and, and all that stuff. And I was able to sort of build a dialogue with an audience and it, it served a lot of good things anyway. So like, but like right now my why would be different. That's so like the, yeah. Like acknowledging yeah. what this project is functionally is really, really hard. Like you may not even be able to fully answer that without, um, answering like just even a little bit and then figuring out the rest as you invest an amount that is healthy for you. Right. So, because you get into the whole feasibility, viability and desirability aspect of it, because are you looking for permission to just go, what criteria are you looking for to make that decision? So if you're like, well, I don't know enough about my why. Of course I want it all. I want, you know, I want to, um, you know, put my creative voice in the world and I want to grow an audience right now. And I want to, you know, uh, get further along in my career and be recognized by my peers. I want to do like, you can like name tons of criteria. And, and I just believe in this story and I've got something to say and I know how to say it or, all right, great. Mm -hmm. um, so then we go about it that go ahead and like, if you have enough confidence to go ahead and try, then what, what is wise to go ahead and try? And if you do a little bit, you know, if you do acknowledge questions that seem like they're the most meaningful or most important at first, where, you know, maybe you are looking for profitability sooner, then that's going to affect the project differently. You know, you really do want to pr produce it as efficiently and as quickly as you can to get answers out there or to get quite observable evidence from the market, not just what people say. I know you mentioned polls earlier. Polls are, mm. yeah, yeah. you know, okay. But like, <laughs> um, it's better, like ob um, observable phenomena. <laughs> yeah. People going to your site, people reading your book, people laughing, reacting or whatever. If you can see it, that's the real data. Yeah. And then if, if people are buying it, right. And that kind of thing, of course, the, 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 those transactions, real data. And if you're trying to like discover a path forward by seeing like, where is the market at right now? This is what a lot of businesses do. This is why startups exist as a function. It's a kind of mm, investing. I don't know. I, it's, a, it'd be shorthand to call it gambling, right? It's gambling to try to discover the odds of a thing, you know, making it in the world. So how can you do that efficiently? efficiently? Um, what alternate interpretations of this creative um, work this meet the market where it's at right now? Hmm. Okay. And, and the, hopefully you're in a position to produce it fast enough to get that data. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking questions you can't get the answers to, probably set those questions aside. If you're like, well... I'll have enough story to test this idea in six months. I don't know if you're going to get the answers about that, that deal with the, the weather of the market moment. You're not making something fast enough to, to adjust. It's kind of like, like I've, I've worked in well, large organizations that deal, like deal with um, product decisions on the scale of two year cycles. Right. And well, that kind of prediction is a lot looser thing, right? So if you can produce something in two weeks, you're going to learn and adjust a lot faster. So think of that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so because like the representation and all the different forms it could take, is it kids, is it animals, is it kids and animals, it's a kid, whatever. Um, <laughs> well, animals with cell phones that call kids. I don't know. <laughs> The kids with cell phones thing was just a shorthand I came up with for meaning like kids in a contemporary know. setting, right? Kids texting each other. Um, 
Right. Cell phones do break a lot of plot things. <laughs> yeah. And and also, yeah, it, I, and I, I know that part of my resistance on that is that, like, well, now I got to research how kids actually use this technology because I don't want to be the tone deaf guy who's like, you know, this is how you, you kids are talking on the TikTok, right? <laughs> Nah, <laughs> but what's funny? So Art Geek Zoo, in a way, like so, jumping up. So, so there's a variety of things where you look back at an old project, like that product. In a way, you are a service. In a way, you are a product. Your career is this collection of all your different endeavors and stuff, and you can reach back and use all of these different experiences to fuel new things. So, I look back at uh, there's there's a variety of. I just things that would wouldn't have made it in the story. I, I would say, um, like I'll be I'll be specific. There is an example of a character who is not who is a minor antagonist, and it's um, let's see, um, she's an ex girlfriend of one of, of Taka, right? Um, and her name's Zana, right? So there's a negative dynamic where she's in the position of giving a grade to this band that this you know to to the group, and their professor sort of swoops in and and um prevents her from doing that right it would be a way more interesting thing to have her you know go further with her actions right i just edited that out before right because she's an antagonist um and now i think it'd be important to explore her perspective further so i but in my practice at the time i didn't have that criteria but like so looking so, so you create a story that has some tone deafness in it. That's like creating software with a bug. If you have time to learn, to observe the bug and repair and revise, um, okay. So then yeah. that's, that's part of the path to get this product developed enough so it can meet its, you know, where it can create a market, right? So I don't know, like the, all these terms, it's funny. It's all about confidence and spending money, right? <laughs> so just the, just this and, and it's all this framing. It's worth, I don't know, worth thinking. No, about it is. It, like, and you're, you're addressing something that I was really having difficulty wrapping my brain around in this, with, even by backing up two steps and saying like how your why is different depending on where you are in your career. Like your why was different then than it is now. So one of the things as I was navigating this on my own is like, well, what, what is stopping me from trying to do this on my own? I'm like, well, there was a, a, a voice in my head said, you have been here before. You have done web comics since 2002, my friend, and none of them, zero of them, ever turned into a revenue source for you. You know, they 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 served as ways to demonstrate your skill. I mean, I got jobs because of the web comics I did. Like, there's a Glencoe McGraw book series where I have like three little short stories in them because the guy, the editor, reached out and said, "I love what you and Sarah Turner are doing on the replacements. Do that for us, and we'll pay you." You know, it's like, wow, that's great. You know, and it was it was a decent page rate. Um, there was that, but there was never none of those books. Like the, the the front rebirth, which I did in 2006, I sold maybe 30 copies of that <laughs> over the last 14 years. You know, um, so there was there was a voice in my head that said, "Like, okay, you you tried that, didn't work. Aha, but." Is my why then the same as my why now? So there are different factors at work. It isn't just doing the same thing over again because I am not the same person. The market is different. The technology is different. And I am different in terms of the way I approach things. So it's not a retread, right? And even if it is a retread, but you're ready to dig in now, you have the ability to invent. There's something probably different about your now, your why now. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, like, I think, so this is also me part of, part in part making peace with my own creative process where um, like some of the, even if I write, if I write a story or if I write an essay, uh, uh, it does not come out of my head in any greatly cons- in, in any really effectively consumable form until I've iterated on it a lot of times. It takes me about 10,000 words to write 2,000 words that are pretty good. So, yeah. eh, which I guess isn't that surprising if you're listening to the show. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, you know, but but at the, being at peace with that and knowing like, well, if I'm going to produce this, it costs that. 
that mm-hmm. kind of thing and not taking it as an immutable fact that's like, okay, that's who I am. I'm never going to change or no, no, it's changing and stuff. But like seeing how that generally works, it's, it's like, well, it's acknowledging a fact, a piece of this overall system of like, should I hire myself? Well, what am I ready to be hired for? Mm-hmm. Uh, and am, am I, um, like what's in my way? Like you, you mentioned, like what's stopping me? So what, what are, is there one barrier? Is there a bunch of barriers? Yeah. Well, there's a bunch. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch in the sense that I can automatically identify the frictions that are coming to come into play. If I did this as, okay, I'm going to do it as a a web comic and use that, that, that churn of checking in on a thing to build momentum, to build the backlog and to build the audience, whatever that looks like. Well, where's it going to be? You got to do it on WordPress. You got to do it on line webtoon. Um, now, now you've got something. Here's another job you got to do. You got to like interact with your audience and cheer them on when they're cheering you on. You got to check in on that. So there's another job you're taking on. Um, where are you scheduling that time for that comic? Are you cutting that out of your evenings? Are, are you, did you just sign on to like, you know, three hours a week? You're doing something at night now. Um, how long are you going to do that? How, how, how strong is your commitment to that? Are you going on vacations or are you going to do that again? Where you like, I'm never on vacation. Um, so, and, and this, this goes back to a, a previous episode. We were talking about like, okay, there's a new technology, the, this live streaming thing, and I'm excited about it. Let's evaluate why I want to use it. How is, how am I going to employ, how am I going to think about marketing? How am I going to think about different ways to make the sawdust of making the thing into a product that I can build excitement around my thing for. So, there's, mm. and then it's the worst, like what yeah. you described is such a trap, by the way. Yeah. It's like, it's one of the things that like software developers get into when they think like they can break, break big problems into small problems. And then like, but how, how granular do you go? Right. Yeah. And at what point is, is generality useful enough? Right. Yeah. Where um, like you can question yourself into um, just, stagnance and just yep, totally stop. Yeah. So that, so are, are you functioning in a way as like your habits and actions that is helping you learn to produce the thing because you believe in it, you gave your yourself per- self en- permission enough to explore it and you, yeah. And well, this is, the, this is the, do you just, you're getting, you're getting to the psychological stuff and this is where I thought it would get uncomfortable for me because like, as I was evaluating this, I'm like, okay, well, why is it okay if you get an advance to, to make that investment and of time and resources because you do the same thing if you're being published. And then it got me to thinking about a couple of instances when this before I was published by Abrams Comic Arts and uh, for a second, and I was at a kid's comics event with other published authors and all I had were my self-published books, right? All I had, mm-hmm. what an interesting way to phrase that, Jersey. Uh, and everybody stands up and they tell the kids about their book before we did the drawing activity. And then I got up there and like, well, Jersey, tell us about your book. And I'm like, well, nobody here's heard of it because you can't get it in stores. <laughs> I start with that. All right. All right. Let's talk everybody out of even wanting to know about this thing right at the front. Why did I do that? You know, and I blasted through my description of the book. I mean, I, I talked faster than I've ever talked on this show. And my my fellow panelists all called me out on it. They're like, what was that? And I'm like, well, you know, why do the, the kids don't know about it? Why would they even want to? You know, it's like they can't get it. So why even talk about it? It was weird that you asked me to do it. Just say I'm a cartoonist and then I draw comics and I'm here to do a thing, you know? And I'm like, whoa, I was so running away from the thing that I invested so much of my life into, right? I was like literally throwing it behind me going like, don't look at that, right? And if I'm going to be honest... It was because partially I felt a little bit of shame. I felt shame that nobody chose this. Only I chose this. Therefore, it's not worthy, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, Jersey, you're better than that. You know, aren't you? So that's something to look at too, is that am I talking myself out of this because I don't want to take on all these extra jobs? Or is it because that I have not adequately dealt with the um, whatever hang up I have about this entity gave me permission. Now I get, I have no problem getting in front of rockets. Somebody wants to ask me about science comics rockets. I will talk your ear off about science comics rockets and why it is an amazing book that you should get. And it's in stores everywhere. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. but when I self publish stuff, like people ask me like, well, does Boulder and fleet have a book? It does. There's a 92 page like graphic novella or whatever you want to call it. That's available in my store. I never talk about it. You know, 
And when I'm talking with kids, I never mention it to them. Why? Right? Why did I put all that effort? So anyway, yeah. It's a, that's um, it's difficult because it's like it's okay to want to have something to be part of the mechanism that is something you feel a lot of favor for, right? So you put a product. Um, so like I fell in love with video games when they were put onto CDs and mass printed and all that kind of stuff. There was no download downloadable content. Yeah. Um, that that's uh, like to get a to get a game that would would be in someone's living room was doable but super not trivial um, yeah. where that, that whole dynamic has changed a lot over, over the years. But like when I started out making video games, there was um, so like when I, to, to make a demo or something like it, whatever fit is what makes it real. Right. What, and that, yeah. that's part of it. Right. Oh but my like, God. <laughs> you're, you're, um, but all, and as far as, you know, what, what makes it real? That's an interesting question to, to look at. What, what also, what are your, what are your blind spots? What are your hangups? Fair enough. You're not going to find that out if you're not making stuff. So like, and, and I, I would argue this. So is, is it time to hire yourself? I would say that you are implicitly because of whatever you're functioning and doing things and you're creating stuff, at least in your head, you're hiring yourself to, not get your ideas in the world. You're, you're implicitly hiring yourself to do something. Why not explicitly hire yourself to keep, to move that thing along toward wherever you feel it's real. Um, that's what, another way to frame it. So like to, to try to find a, 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 like a constructive, not cavalier way to look at that question, because of course we could just talk all Dragon Ball Z about it or whatever. Right. Of course. We well, like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, we could, I've been doing this long enough now that I'm not, I don't get really excited about the romance of, but you can do it on your own. If you believe in yourself, you go out there, you do it on your own. You'll be, you'll be a trailblazer. I'm like, okay, yeah, I did my share of that kind of what I perceive to be trailblazing. I want to do something that, you know, where I know that the investment is going to pay off in some way, in some way beyond the fact of saying I did it, you know, and whether that's financial or it's, it's fulfilling some other need, fulfilling some other uh, desire in my life. Um, so what gives you confidence in that, in the payoff? So what's the payoff and yeah. what gives you confidence to say, proceed? Because that very thing, that decision is the act of hiring yourself. So that's, um, because that's the exact decision that someone is going through where it's, where it's like, yeah, we're, we're going to engage in a, um, you know, contractually with you for this, this creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And here's an advance or whatever mechanism that your industry does to, to make that work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it could be something so, as simple as a sense of frustration that this thing is really cool. I would like it to exist. Nobody is going to be a partner with me on this. So I guess I got to just make it and then see what happens with it. But at least it'll exist. It could be as simple as that. But like, I got to, I got to really believe in that statement in order to commit the year, I did the math. I sat down and like did the number crunching. It, it will take me at least a year and a half to do the book as a side hustle. Had it, mm. had it optimized for an eight month turnaround. If it was forty hours a week, if I'm going to be only be doing it a couple hours a week, it's going to be a year and a half to make. So okay, now I've got some estimates as to like what the commitment I'm, I'm asking of myself if I hire myself to do this. So what what's baked into that I think is is um, is you you're looking at like like the estimation of, of effort to bring about the thing in the form in like so what expression of that i that story baron von bear into the world um just it that's the worthy expression that you feel like that gives you confidence that it will do its job right mm -hmm. so because yeah. you're hiring it's going to do something's doing a job for you right yeah um, hiring yourself you're also hiring this project and that's where like investors would be, would, would think of that where, um, you know, so a lot of times in, in, you know, dealing with like incubator type thought processes and creative, um, practices where, uh, there's all this criteria that that's, that's in a way it's like tested enough heuristics that that group of people believe in that helps them get confidence in a thing. And then, and like, like you mentioned um, earlier, just in, in interviews and conversations with, with peers in the industry, Jersey, how 
um, you know, you're hearing from their criteria. It's like, well, um, I don't know, like all that, what, if, if that is helping you move forward, great. If it's stopping you to find a different question, find a different thing to tune into, because you want to get to the point where you've, you've, you've thought about it enough and also acknowledge that if, if you are the kind of person that's thinking about this stuff that much, you're going to do something with that time. So, um, pick the, pick the thing to invest in or pick the things to invest in that, that, um, you know, you, you believe in enough for whatever reasons you do because you're the incubator in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I feel like we've modeled the questions enough. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I hope nobody was expecting me to like make an announcement at the end going, and this is what I'm going to do because I really don't think that that is the interesting part of the discussion. The interesting part for me is evaluating like what are the questions that we should be asking ourselves when we're navigating this choice of whether to take something to a market or, or to an industry and to try to find a partner in trade or give your, what it means to give yourself permission. Because that's another thing that I feel like is uh, deceivingly simple in what it's expressing. It's a loaded statement, right? Mm. Sure. Oh, totally. So, and, and I like the I like the way of phrasing it, like hiring yourself, because that to hire somebody implies that there's going to be some kind of research into what am I asking them to do? Do they have what it takes? Hiring the project, what am I asking it to do? What do I need it to do? What are the success criteria? Can I meet those success criteria? So. Hmm. And yeah, maybe that helps helps it function well enough. One thing that I do, I am trying to work on that, uh, like, so, so sometimes as I'm, uh, you know, through my coaching or doing mentoring and whatnot, and or just being part of brain trusts here and there, I uh, I once in a while ask for feedback. And so, like, you're like your part of your takeaway is that the the questions are the the gold, right? And uh, I agree with that. <laughs> Totally. We're, you know, doing this podcast with you for over nine years now, but the, um, the other place that sometimes like provision, like provisional answers help too. Right. Because sometimes when folks ask me questions and I only give them questions. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's not always like, Hey, thanks. That's fair. That's fair. I, I just, I just meant that I didn't, I was trying to avoid the idea of that. This is like, any more than ostensibly about helping me, right? This is just using my scenario as a mm. framing mechanism. But I mean... True enough, true. So, I mean, if if I were to say like, okay, after listening to these, you know, talking with you about it, listening to the questions you have for me, um, it seems like... And, and, and to be fair, this is still out to some publishers. There are still some publishers looking at it, right? So it's like mm -hmm. things. Uh -huh. this whole situation could change. But... um but having gotten that feedback and, and finding myself acting on it, the question was put in front of me. It was like, well, why not just do it yourself? And so um, my thinking right now is based on that, is that uh, after October, like actually I would like possibly use this October season of creative challenges as a way to like sort of jumpstart it, is uh, get get the, the outline done so I can start moving on it. Um, and my next step between now and then would be like, okay, let's now we're going to look at platforms. What platforms do I see as being the one where like, there's the most, um, the most exciting interaction happening. Right. Um, and where do I see people that I want to read this going? Right. It's so like, like something else I've said in the past is like one of the, the difficulties with doing web comics that I want to do is, um, it's really difficult to get the kids, you know, but, there are platforms now where younger people are reading comics, line webtoon, tapastic, you know, like my, I, I have evidence of this by virtue of the fact that my students read these, read comics on those platforms. Okay. Well, that's something that's different from 2006, you know? So, but I need to do more looking to see like what, what is popular on those platforms? What is getting a lot of reaction on those platforms? Um, do you though? Don't I? Do you? <laughs> so that's the thing. So, right. So if, is that an important enough criteria for you? Where are you in the situation where part of what makes this product and project successful 
Is it looking for that market moment? Mm. Or are you looking to um, establish that through, because the other way that products, products grow success in part, like there's a, there's an interesting, uh, like I mentioned this a few times, I know in our conversations, but oh no, it disappeared in my notes. The, um, there's a talk I saw someone give that is about the, um, uh, the, the, the thesis of their book and it's called hit makers. Oh, it's just killing me. I had it pulled up in my notes, but it disappeared. So, um, hit make, make the science of popularity in an age of distraction. There we go by Derek Thompson. Yes. So this is one source, right? But this is someone who did a, a, you know, a bunch of research and came to some ideas about, um, like, so you create a thing, you want it to, you know, to, to take hold in the market and have enough people, you know, adopt it, be interested, engage in trade with you to, um, to meet some level of success. Right. And, you know, a lot of times we're chasing some, something that is like, that is scaled big and it's viral and it, whatever. So understandable, you know, we, we see celebrated examples of that and, um, it's, uh, Finding a, like, that's, that's an interesting uh, second aspect, because even if you made the thing that's exactly right for the market right now, the spreading, the mechanism that spreads that awareness is being part of a large platform, which is one of the things you do. It, it, you, you theoretically gain by being part of a publisher, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how can you grow your platform? How can you scrappily like, coming from a small platform, how do you, you know, gain that, that, um, you know, gain a foothold in the market. And I think you have that trouble challenge or what have you of, of while well, marketing and merchandising your product, no matter what, even if it is perfect in its, you know, in, in its, um, it's made of the perfect recipe of your creative voice in a, in a, in an approachable, inclusive audience way that, that, that represents what audiences are engaging with right this moment. Um, if, if you are doing that and because you've been, well, uh, I don't know, hired by Netflix or something like that, well, you get the, vi the virality is, is, comes from being part of a big platform, right? So that's the question is, is, um, gaining that market. Uh, it's, is a second job. It's another job, I guess. So your creative product can only do so much of that. And that's, uh, that's where the luck factor is. And are you, you might be tuning opportunity and luck toward your, you know, to your benefit by making your, your, um, your art easier to consume by the market. Cool. But the other ask the, the, that to really acknowledge that problem, it's a separate problem. Mm -hmm. because people can fall in love with the, I, um, the, they can, yeah, I, 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 it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it's a this, therefore that, right. So, um, a bear you know, on relatable adventures may be relatable enough if more people, if, if enough people are aware of the bear. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's interesting. So like, that's where not to just, you know, to, sell past the close and we were about to wrap up this section, but there's, that is like this thought process is, is the, um, it's not just like if, if any of us as creators, makers of anything can just have the right incantation at the right time, success is guaranteed. Right. right. And it's not it. It's, it's the, it's, it's a complex system of other components that I think one of those two different buckets of those problems that I'm working at improving on are merchandising and marketing. And the marketing is the awareness aspect. The merchandising is being able to act upon that awareness. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, cause tons of people it's what it's think about like the viral tweet, right? Where, um, someone made a thing that becomes widespread because of a platform and chaos and weather of people's attention. And then they go, Oh, by the way, there's my SoundCloud. This, yeah, the, yeah. the SoundCloud <laughs> follow-up tweet is the merchandising. Yeah. The marketing is the, yeah. But <laughs> a lot of times that that's more like luck by 
gambling, right? So luck by, as opposed to like, in, in, the way to change that is to try to, well, find the venues. Like you mentioned, you're testing venues and stuff. Yeah. So where, where can you get a foothold and are you able to grow that? Right. And um, yeah, that's an interesting, truly challenging, but separate problem. Yeah. Kind of related. Cause yes, if you create obtuse art, you're making your job, you're making everyone's job harder. <laughs> well, I, I feel like this is a topic we can come back to later on in the year after I've started to, you know, experiment with this and, um, figure out what I want to do next with it. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't have the cycles to really give it all my, my full thought right now. It's just, it's like, this is sort of mm -hmm. like a moment of time where I'm wrestling with the idea, trying to figure out what do I do next? Um, so we can check in maybe in October sometime uh, to see where I'm at, where my head is at on this. Uh, but I would be very interested in hearing from the leaners on how they approach the, these questions and their work. Um, how, do you, how do you think about these success criteria? Um, how do you find out, what, how has the why changed for you over the years? And how you think about applying that why to maybe try something uh, that you've tried before in a new way. Um, I think that'd be cool to hear from them on that. So, but thank mm -hmm. you, Rob. This Especially was, in the discord. Yeah. yeah. Which we'll talk about in a few seconds here. Cause we're gonna take one more break before we go to our two minute challenge. But thank you, Rob. Thank you for the thoughtful journeying through this, this, this topic. Um, I personally benefited from, from ways that I haven't even shared on the show yet. Cause I'm still processing it. And also it's like, I kind of want to wait until I have more data. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for uh, rolling with it. And uh, yeah, there's, I, this is hard. This is hard stuff to, to think about. Hiring yourself is easy when, it, you know, you're, you're, you're walking across a chasm with a rickety rope bridge is not that hard when you're not paying attention. And yeah. then if you look back and you're like, oh crap, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're more aware of that, 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 that whatever. So it's, <laughs> it's you know, mixed bag mixed bag of experience but anyway no this is this is cool so like you're you're pitching up the next stuff because we're going to talk about two minutes practice in a minute right yeah yeah check in on our two minute practice but before we do that we got to thank some people who make the show possible those people are us we make the show possible we make lots of things we think hard about the things we make and we bring that thinking into this project called lean into art and the thing that i make that i hope you will check out is this other podcast called the four million years later podcast and it's me and my buddy hoover talking about the Transformers cartoon series one episode at a time. Like we, we walk through every moment of the episode and I go hog wild with story analysis about how the animators approach things, how the writers approach things, um, how I engaged with it as a child and how my engagement with the story changes in my adulthood. Sometimes it doesn't change. Other times it's vastly different. And one thing that I haven't made a mention of that is also fun in the show is that we actually make note of the act breaks and when the show went to commercial. And then we usually spend a little bit of time talking about three commercials from our childhoods uh, and reflecting on them during the, during the actual uh, com commercial break before coming back to find out what happened after that exciting cliffhanger. So you can hear us talking about Milk It Does a Body Good, um, the Play-Doh Fun Factory, and you know Captain Vitamin cereal and things like that. In addition to Transformers, so it's a it's a nostalgic trip, but it's also a lot of really like I try to do some serious storytelling analysis and really breaking down, you know, what what came through great, what needed work, uh, what I'm inferring as a young person as I'm uh, following along with this story. And you can find it at four million years later dot com or in your favorite podcatcher. Four million years later. Um, Rob, you want to talk about your story? It's, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I like it when I have a beat, uh, like a little beat to react, right? Okay. It's like anime when, when, when someone blows up the moon, then <laughs> someone's got to freak out about it. Right. So I just want to freak out about 4 million years later and that it's super cool. Like, uh, um, Jersey going hog wild with story analysis <laughs> is super great. And honestly, Hoover is a great co-host. Like you guys have an awesome, um, like, you know, dynamic in your relationship and it's, uh, some great energy, different perspectives. And, and that's, I mean, that's good listening. It's great listening for so many things, you know, that it's, it's like the classic, um, you know, classic thing that, that you would hire a podcast for. Well, put that thing in your, in your podcatcher because it's going to be a great accompaniment accompaniment for, you know, 
anything from mowing the lawn, doing the dishes to um, if you have a commute, it's awesome. Yeah. And Thanks to, to hear that because it's so comforting. It's like, I don't, I care like a little bit about transformers and that's a MacGuffin in my opinion, the, 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 the prize, the, the, the thing is, is, is how you two converse and the story analysis. So, mm. and like, there's a prize in every darn podcast. We, so. It's, it's very much akin to lead into in that like Hoover and I both show up with a very sincere attempt to think hard on this thing that we care about a lot. It's not enough just to say, Oh, I like Optimus cause he's cool. We got to dig at some why beyond that, you know? <laughs> um, and and yeah, we do. We spend a lot of time on that. So yeah, there's the 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 latest episode is uh, episode thirty, Dinobot Island Part One, which was a fun one because it's really spending some time focusing on the Dinobots and getting to hear Hoover get very grumpy and uncomfortable with the fact that they just roll out like fifteen new characters in this episode without any backstory. They just show up, and he's like, "But you, you, you... I love that story, beat. <laughs> hey, where'd they come from? Yeah, he... it's a great. It's it's a beat that." Um... Yeah, it's good stuff. So there's there's one of those things the the whole how you you two how the show is produced and stuff. There's there's great little sound beats and all that stuff too. Um, mm. That especially highlighting moments when characters show up mysteriously. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's del- delightful. So let's talk about something that you make, Rob. You've got a whole store. Oh right, I have a whole store. If you go to robstenzinger.com slash store.html, you'll be able to get to all kinds of different things that I create. I do provide the service of creative process coaching, and that's for you as an individual or, or for your team. And that's, you know, anything from maybe you're making a big decision on your career, or you're working on a product, or you want to have a conversation with me, kind of like we do on Lean Into Art. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to help. And that's uh, also, I mean, I am a huge proponent and um, Someone who applies and is and loves the idea of user experience, where you're including the humans, all the humans, and what you make. And yet, if you're not really super experienced in in making those kind of decisions and setting up ways to get data and collaborate through those decisions, uh, well, I'm here to help you and your team get set up to do that. So I've got the coaching. I've also I, um, I've got workshops. So you can check those out there and uh, things like um, drawing user journey maps, uh, cu- uh, customizing uh, your next creative challenge. Drawing user journey maps is recently has over 200 students on Skillshare and that continues to grow. Wow. Um, so come on down there. And um, if you use the, the link on the site, you do get like a couple months free on, on Skillshare. But uh, if you're already there, it's like, well, it's, it's kind of a Netflix for learning and stuff. So just go ahead and check it out. Right. Um, but then if you're, you don't, you don't have to buy my workshop or use Skillshare to engage with my workshops. I also provide them as downloadable and streamable through Gumroad. So a lot of options for you there. Also guitar fretter, the update I mentioned last week, still in progress. I am working super hard to polish and make it to guitar fretter. The game I made to, to make, uh, to, to make a, a action puzzle game out of memorizing the, the notes on a guitar fretboard for four and five string bass, six and seven string guitar. Um, it's guitar fretter classic because I'm working on the next generation of it too. But you know what? Classic needs a little bit of love and I'm putting a lot into it to get it extra tight and polished with some visual upgrades and some, some um, honestly, a little bit of the, a um, little bit of difficulty challenge. If you choose, if you choose the hard path, it's more fun and interesting there. And also just, I'm doing some bug squishing. I'm making that thing as, um, as refined as I can to mm. it just, it's a big update. So I'm making the most of it. So stay tuned for that. But you can, of course, uh, check out uh, guitarfretter.com and, and uh, you're welcome to buy it along the way. You'll get the update, of course, um, just part of your platform. Mm. Um, all right. All right. That's what I had to share today. Guitarfretter.com, which I have, and it is a fun game. Uh, it is fun to play whether or not you're, you're trying to learn the guitar. Um, okay, so then the other thing we'll help you check out is the Lean Tart Discord, and there will be an invite link in the show notes for this episode and every episode. And it's the Lean Tart Forum. It's a place for you, to, for you to comment on episodes as we stream them or after we stream them. Uh, you can suggest p- potential topics. And there's a Patreon-only section where you can... Uh, interact with a brain trust of fellow leaners when you're working on different projects. And thanks to everybody who has been interacting with us there. It is has been really, really fun to get to know you and find out the kinds of things that you've been working on and engaging with in your creative pursuits. 
um, that helps. I mean, it, it literally has helped generate topic ideas for the show as well. So we're grateful for that. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's like having a place to, to have conversation that relates to this creative product and, and all that stuff. And then our, our common ground that we share, which we're all making stuff and we like to think about it. So, so yeah, that's a great place to keep that going. Um, two minute practice time. Hey, hey. Jersey. Hey, Hey Rob. Time to talk about our two minute <laughs> practice. Um, what did we do this week? What was our two minute practice? Ah, I think it was something I'm paraphrasing, but like sit there and think about what you've done or wait. <laughs> um, no, it was sitting, but it was posture related. Thanks Thank for you. laughing at my, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm literally fueled in my days by making the like slightly chuckleable joke. And I'm like, that's it. I'm doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day. <laughs> well, also so, sit there and think about what you've done also feels like it's of a time, right? I, I don't know if that's actually getting used <laughs> anymore. You know, go sit oh there gosh. and think about what you did today. Like when I was 10, I'm like, what does that mean? I'm going to sit here and stare at the walls. I don't know what to do. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It's, um, it's, but it is funny because honestly, it's, um, it was like, a, it's, obviously we were, we're practicing things we want to um, just somehow get new ideas and insight about two minutes at a time. Isn't that much, right. Which is great, but also, um, you know, so it makes it cheap to try different things. And, but then again, like sitting in a, in an intentional way, like thinking about your posture for two minutes. Um, I don't know. I don't know about you, but that felt like a, it feels longer to me than, mm -hmm. than, than like two minutes of drawing, right? Oh yeah. So yeah, two minutes of drawing feels like a race. Um, a lot of times, and and I've I've chronicled on this this section of the show and in the two minute practice microcast that um, I've I've learned to become comfortable where I'm not racing against the clock and just enjoying the idea of mm. time boxing two minutes. But this was a different experience because this was it was like meditation and meditation, which I've done very serious in the past. I've dabbled with it in recent years, but nothing to where I would call it like a regular practice in my life. Um, it always feels like the first five to 10 minutes of meditation is me just letting thoughts race through my head before I finally begin to like focus on my breath and relax. Um, two minutes is not enough time for that. Right. So it, it, but I did, I don't know about you, but I did try to do the whole guided meditation idea of like, okay, I'm thinking about how my feet feel. I'm thinking about how my knees feel. I'm thinking about how my shoulders feel. Um, I tried to do that and I don't know. I mean, how, how did you feel about that afterwards? Well, it, it felt like a, a like, um, like, a, like, like we almost had a prompt that was about meditation, but we backed into it. Right. That's, that's a little bit like what it felt for me. Yeah. Um, and, um, I didn't, I think because of my, my setup in my office, I didn't, um, I, I did the practice like four, four, four times. Yeah. And it was, um, like, like only once did I sit because I have to kind of go out of my way to like to sit. And I'm, I, I have a standing workstation for the most part, right? If in, and it takes a little bit of shuffling around in my space. So I just sort of, um, where like a lot of times if I do a two minute practice where I, it, it's, it's something that's typically toward the end of one of my work sessions. And I'm like, and I'm going to do that two minute practice. And it's a nice way to switch gears and stuff typically between working on something and then, you know, doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, but then it's like, okay, where am I going to sit? And I, and I have kind of a, I don't know what it's called. It's a, it's one of those, like a simple cushion on a pogo stick kind of thing. Okay. I don't know what to call that chair, but it's, um, it's a chair, a kind of chair that I noticed that was in my kid's elementary school. And it's somehow it's supposed to allow some kind of, uh, like ergonomic, it, it's, something about it's ergonomic because it's not so um, consistently stable as, as a regular chair, I guess. And I'm not an ergonomic expert, but anyway, it's um, so yeah, I ended up trying, I tried sitting and I tried um, uh, 
I actually tried laying down and I tried standing. Hmm. So I just sort of went in different ways with this where there's because, but every single situation was about, Oh wait, I'm noticing my posture now. And I'm like, wait a minute, am I meditating? Cause I'm starting to notice. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of what each of them felt like for me. So um, what about you, Jersey? How did well, that- I, I did all of mine sitting and I, like I said, in the last uh, practice, uh, I have a kneeling chair uh, that I, I fell in love with kneeling chairs like a decade ago and I still love them. Um, but yeah, it just, I mean, if I were to have a takeaway from it, it just, it made me more mindful of my posture this last week. So like, uh, I try to every day at least go for a walk, like a, a long walk around the neighborhood to like, decompress in the day or take a break in the day. And I did notice that I was more aware of my spine when I was walking, uh, just because it, it's been a part of my experience on like a daily basis. So, um, <laughs> There was one thing that changed in my daily life that I noticed as a result of engaging with the practice. Um, and then the other, the other takeaway is it just it made me miss meditation. You know, and it made me realize, like, I, I keep saying it. I need to make space for this thing in my life. But um, if nothing else, I need to create many spaces for it in my life. I would much rather do, like, a half hour of this. But back when I was taking... Uh, taking what's the word for it i was participating in aikido uh classes ages ago and our sensei would actually have us at the end of every practice sit down for about a minute or two and we would just meditate and then he would touch the mat gently to indicate we're done and then he would ask he'd say like does anybody feel different you know how do you feel um Mm. so i was reminded of that too i was reminded of this idea of like it's just also a way to check in with myself how am i feeling right now and I did do some extra sessions because I had a lot of meetings this week and it was a good excuse to say like, okay, before I go to the meeting, before I open up Zoom, I'm just going to sit for two minutes, you know, and I'm going to check in how I feel before I engage at the room, you know. That's really interesting. I mean, that's, um, it, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Like there's interesting, like, like a two minute, ha- like I, I didn't even think of like, well, I, I, I asked like, this feels like meditating. Am I meditating? And I thought about that a lot, but then it's, um, and it was calming overall, but like, and it was a break and that's mm-hmm. nice. Mm-hmm. But then I, it's a good point where it's serving a little bit of that, of a, of a function of a, of, so like having um, a pause between stuff, which can be useful, but it doesn't have to be the full meditation session pause. Mm-hmm. but then it reminds you of that value of that too. So it's, it'd be nice to work that in. So I, I didn't explicitly consider that. Um, hmm. but, but now you mention it, it's like, uh, that would be good to try to, to, to schedule that. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. hmm. yeah, I would like to at least, I mean, and that's, that's, that's an ongoing and never ending puzzle is, is it, it is. It, it really is because like the two minutes I've, I, here's one of my worries about two minute practices. Like what if I collect a pile of two things that now that I want part of my day every what, single day? What's that game where you're rolling the big ball that keeps picking up more stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it's Katamari Damacy. Yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I found another uh, thing I like to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess I'm doing that now every day. Uh, but yeah, this is this is one that actually has that like a um it's really like serious potential. It's it's like they like they ask you like when you're you're working in office environments and all that stuff, try to not schedule everything to the to the hour to hour, right? Mm-hmm. Where you know, create a little bit of space and all of a sudden that this is like one of those a, like a pretty useful, interesting thing, or actually any number of two minute practices might be something that you could do as a reset. And, uh, yeah, so now I, I feel like that's, that's part of, I the, need to keep thinking about that. The meta practice of the two minute practice for me is like just having a weekly mindful engagement with things that we know are good for us or would be worth trying and then just trying them for a while. Um, and so rather than like, oh no, I've collected too many practices. It's like, well, we'll probably come back to this at some point too. Right. Like the, the, the act of doing the practice is going to bring us around to practices that have been tried or ones that we want to try. So, mm-hmm. so, well, that's reasonable. 
<laughs> so I guess I mean it's a way to talk me out of like uh oh I collected another thing right right yeah, yeah. I mean because like this this itself what we're doing right now is a practice <laughs> of, good, of good recruiting <laughs> recruiting and trying out other practices so um, so that said what do we want to do in the next week we did a we did a physical one um, we've done some writing mm-hmm. ones. So I don't know if this is a writing one, but this is, I, I, I thought of this just as we we're, we we're going along recording today's show. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know what's because i like this. I, ever since we, we had Jen Vaughn as a guest on our podcast, the, like uh, she mentioned this idea of bibliomancy and, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's so neat. And I thought like, what would be, what would be a helpful um, bibliomancy thing for um for storytelling and stuff but like a two minute practicable thing so i thought this is a what if i'm not uh, i don't know i'm not sold on this but what if you did you like took took comics and books and stuff off the shelf that you care about a lot and then did the bibliomancy thing where you flip up flip it open to a random page and see if anything there is something that you care about a lot like you react to strongly and positively or negatively that's it so like, just do, do a hunt for, um, reconnecting with big feeling story stuff through bibliomancy. So you would need to, in order for that, I would, I would probably grab a few books off my shelf and then flip it open. Am I reacting? Flip it open. Am I reacting? And then, it, you know, you probably need to say like, I noticed this and I've thought, I thought about it negatively. I noticed that I thought it because, you know, it could be a lot of things. And in there is like, it's, that's a storytelling mechanism or storytelling influence hunting in a way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Willing to try. So um, if I'm, let me try to summarize to make sure I understood. Um, I'm going to grab some comics off my shelf that I like. I'm going to flip them open. Uh, two minutes, flip them open and start flipping through. And when something grabs me or arrests me, if I notice that I'm reacting in some way, reacting means a lot of things. Everybody reacting is the, 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 the umbrella term for feelings. Um, what did I like jot down one thing I noticed as I reacted to it? Maybe it's not the thing you're reacting mm-hmm. to, but maybe it's just it's it's part of the collection of details that you are reacting to. That's one thing that stands out. Mm-hmm. Write it down. OK. However you capture that, I think there's there's um, there's storytelling awareness in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is another way of talking about uh, when people talk about like, oh, here's my top five influences. Right. But now we're we're doing mm-hmm. it in a sort of like a, a discovery mode. That's good. Okay. Hmm. Well, let's try it. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. Okay. So we did it. We did another podcast. And uh, thanks to everybody who downloads, listens, and watches. Thanks to everybody who gives us reviews and ratings. It means a lot to us. Thanks to the people who support us in on Patreon and hang out in the in the Discord. Uh, we record weekly on Thursdays and we stream it live on Discord and then collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanatwart and leanatwart.com. We'll be back with another episode soon. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanatwart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanatwart.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.